So good morning. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Katari. Uh, before I do, though, uh, uh, I just need to let uh, y'all know that uh, uh, a really a reliable and loyal attendee of this uh, conference, uh, Raul Vela, uh, passed away recently. Dr. Vela sat right here at uh, uh, almost every meeting we had, and so I would ask you to keep uh, his, uh, his family and your thoughts and prayers, and uh, when we know more about services, we'll, we'll send out notification. Um, it's, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Shanu Katari. Uh, I've known Dr. Katari through, primarily through the Southwest, Southwest Surgical Congress, but also through the, the American College of Surgeons. Uh, Dr. Katari is originally from Illinois, but uh, has spent uh, most of his professional career at the Gunderson uh, Clinic, where he's the chief of, uh, of uh, minimally invasive and bariatric uh, surgery there. Uh, he's, uh, he's been a, uh, I guess not quite so young now, but uh, a young, young leader uh, of, uh, of minimally invasive bariatric surgery really in the United States. Uh, he uh, serves as the uh, uh, a past uh, president of the Wisconsin Surgical Society. He's uh, on the American College of Surgeons Board of Governors from Wisconsin. He's on the ASMBS Executive Council. Uh, he served as a key leader of the Southwestern Surgical Congress uh, as the Secretary uh, Treasurer uh, and is on the uh, uh, Fellowship Council Executive Committee at large. Uh, it is uh, my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Katari, who's going to uh, uh, give us uh, lessons from the lake. Dr. Katari. All right. Thank you for that kind introduction. Uh, really enjoy uh, the, the privilege of being here. Yeah. Um, the hospitality has been amazing. Uh, from the meal last night to uh, PPG's, um, you know, chauffeuring me around everywhere, which is really nice. Um, I spend a lot of time uh, studying uh, PYY, which is a satiety hormone, because I also do bariatric <laughs> surgery. But I, uh, I'm excited because I always say we haven't discovered every hormone yet in the body, and I want, I want the next one to be called PPG. So um, I'm going to find one just for that reason. So. All right. And so, um, again, it's a privilege to be here. I, uh, you know, I wouldn't be here, uh, you know, as I was actually sharing, uh, my story has been very, I've been very blessed with my career, uh, the way um, uh, I, I've been guided through it by the good Lord. And uh, of course, one of the great things is the people you meet and the relationships that you form. And uh, this one, the only reason I'm here really is because of uh, having the privilege of meeting Ronnie through Southwest Surgical Congress. And uh, again, a great organization. I'd really encourage all of you to become members if you are not already. Um, and uh, I have to admit my motives were not pure a decade ago when I first began to submit uh, research to this meeting because I never knew a meeting that uh, had, its, had its meetings in such exotic locations. And so this one is gonna be in Maui. I'd encourage you all to come. Um, <clears throat> But you know, I live in Wisconsin, and so uh, I would go to these meetings because, like I said, they're in exotic locations when it's still not great weather in La Crosse, and this, this is my house. <laughs> and so this is what motivated me to become a member. So my motives were not pure, I'll have to admit, that's just a confession. Uh, but nevertheless, I've really gone on to uh, love, this, love this society, and I... I, but everyone's like, but you don't live in the Southwest. And so, well, that, I, I just didn't like that um, tagline with me. And so I, I actually changed the map. So here's Wisconsin. We actually are now a member. And for those of you who uh, maybe aren't, uh, who are geographically challenged a bit, so here's your country right here. And then um, we are an island, just like Hawaii, right up here. Um, so nevertheless. So. <laughs> So anyway, we have had a lot of good times together. Um, I've gotten to know Ronnie, um, and um, this was really interesting because this is 
uh, after we had just heard an ethics lecture on oxymorons, and the example they gave was jumbo shrimp. Think about that for a second. So what does Ronnie go ahead and order? Jumbo shrimp. And so, um, of course, his lovely wife, I really, I, I love this picture. Not only is it because it's a beautiful picture of them, but I took it with his really fancy camera. And so, um, he has had a significant influence on me. This, as you can tell, is uh, from a recent uh, medical mission trip to Haiti. I took these, trying to be Ronnie. Um, not quite the same effect, but nevertheless, uh, it wasn't fancy. It was iPhone 6, I'll yeah. confess. Um, now, we've all been, you know, he's a tremendous leader, but we, you know, we've all been admonished by him. We know what this is like, but, um, uh, you know, through him, I've also gotten to meet some of his other close colleagues, you know, Brian Eastridge. And of course, Rich, who's absolutely fantastic. Um, you can argue, yeah, you could argue. I mean, I'm taller, so mine looks, so I'm, I'm actually, I think his, I'm, yeah, well, anyway, you guys can argue who's got more ribbon, but nevertheless, um, really have had a lot of fun uh, getting to know Rich, and I owe him, because of him, I, I don't know Facebook, I don't know what that is, but uh, because of him, I do Twitter, and uh, he taught me about Twitter, and, and it's become really a good tool for, actually, for research. Um, and networking, and so I, I thank him for that. Now, just in case of the recent election, if you guys were concerned, this will never happen, because um, Melanie Richards, who some of you may know, uh, was my senior resident. We trained together at the Gunderson Clinic, and so, so just when you think I might have, you know, rise to power in some way, she's got so much dirt on me that she could take me down in, in you know, two seconds, and so this, will, this would never happen, so. All right, I, uh, my disclosures uh, will have nothing to do with my talk today, my industry relationships, uh, but I would like to disclose, you know, that my faith and my family are the most important aspects of my life, and that will somewhat influence a little bit of what I have to share with you here today. Now, I love being a surgeon. I absolutely love it. I hope you guys do too. Um, CNN Magazine says that we were um, ranked number four. Uh, actually, I don't know where those notes went. They were sitting here. Um, oh, sorry. That's all right. CNN Magazine. Yeah, they're right there. Just in case. You know, ranked us number four as a career. Um, I personally think it's number one, but nevertheless, uh, they ranked us number four. And it really is a privilege to be a general surgeon. Um, but the price that comes with that is not without its cost. 60% said that they would retire today if they got the opportunity to do so, if they had the financial means. When you look at the, the, the amount of depression and burnout, the more hours you work and the more call you take, it proportionally increases the amount of uh, depression among surgeons. When you know, they did a, uh, the, when you go to take your American boards, they, they quizzed you. And they said, you know, gee whiz, what would make your life better as a surgeon? And they thought, well, less call, get sued less, and make more money would make my life better. I guess you can't argue with that necessarily. And so, um, sadly, alcohol use uh, uh, and abuse is not uh, infrequent among surgeons. As you can see, it's even higher amongst our female colleagues. So... Um, 51%, only 51% uh, would recommend their child pursue a career in physician, as a physician or surgeon. This is where I'm at right now. I got a 16-year-old daughter, and um, um, damn, she wants to be a surgeon. And I am like, oh, man, really? You know, you really want to spend your life being trained by people like me? And so I'm, I'm on the fence. I'm really, I'm part of that 51. I'm right on the bubble. So, um, and then sadly, um, about 9% said they've made a major medical error. Uh, in, in recent months, um, uh, suffering for, uh, under, under burnout. And these, these aren't like system-wide errors. I mean, these were te true technical or judgment errors uh, that could, when they, when they drilled down on them, was clearly related to the underlying uh, conditions of burnout and depression. Um, they did a survey then uh, of academic surgeons, over 1,300. Um, what's important to you? And particularly, I, I, this is so much more prevalent now than... Um, than some of the data that I've presented here, is money's not the most important thing. Everyone wants to come out and think, you know, but that's not why you end up leaving your jobs. These are the reasons you know. De department governments is important. Collegiality, getting relate, you know, relationship with your supervisors. In the business sector, what's it called? People join companies, but they leave managers. 
Okay, so who you work with is very important. Um, and, you know, money and benefits was up there, but it wasn't up there anywhere near what it was uh, for other things that are much more important. So it's easy to get burned out. Um, and I like this one, you know, it's just a, it's a fleeting sense of purpose. I'm sure it'll pass. And so um, when you think about what we do for a living, um, I live on the Mississippi River, okay? So that's that funny jagged line between Wisconsin and Minnesota. That's the Mississippi River. So that's the borders there. And uh, I try to combat this myself. Um, so I'm a river rat. I do spend a fair amount of my time now on the Mississippi River. <laughs> and so this is where you can find us, you know, the three days of the year that we have summer up in Wisconsin. <laughs> Uh, this, this is called a, you know, raft off here, so you bring your boats up, you just tie them up, uh, you just, they're the friendliest people you've ever met, you know, they'll give you the shirt off your back, they'll just really be there for you, and um, so this is what I like to do, and this is when the, it's get, the fall colors come through, uh, it's very beautiful, um, now this is, um, this is what we call a barge, and so, um, this is a lock and dam, and this is how you have to get through them. This is how you stair step to get from Minneapolis to St. Louis. There's 27 of these, like every 20 miles. So it's kind of constraining because commercial traffic, which is still how the best economic means of transportation for all these grain and coal and everything, is, uh, is by barge. So it takes two hours for one of those to get through there. So if they beat you there, you have to sit for two hours and wait for them to go through, and then you get to go through, and that's how you go. So, I mean, I love river life, but it's, it's kind of constraining. It's kind of uh, claustrophobic, if you will. And so I was always fascinated with big water. And I thought, boy, wouldn't it be great just to take my boat over to Lake Michigan and just be able to go anywhere? And I had... Years ago, I, I, I got this bucket list idea that what, you know, because every time I go to a town by river, I always think, you know, the, the food tastes better and the drinks are stronger when you arrive by boat. And, um, and so uh, I thought, boy, wouldn't it be great to go to Mackinac Island and eat fudge and to arrive by my own boat? And, you know, for those of you who don't know, this is Mackinac Island up here. And so this is where I live over here, but I got to get my boat over here. Believe it or not, you can go by water if you want. I just didn't have that much time. Um, so I thought, well, I had this bucket list idea and I was privileged enough to work at an institution that provides sabbatical. So to try and combat some of this burnout and, and things that we talked about, um, after your first 10 years of service, you get an extra 25 days off paid leave at our institution. And then every five years thereafter. So the trip I'm about to share with you is from five years ago. So my kids are older now, they're, they're younger in these photos and, uh, as am I. And then um, um, you get to, you, then you, so I just banked another 25 days, so I get to do somewhere over the next five years, I could do another thing. And this is for, you know, do a mission trip, take some classes, take some time off, visit a place you've never done before, refresh, rejuvenate, to try and combat some of those, uh, uh, some of that data that I first shared with you there. And so this is the boat getting plucked out, put it on a semi, and then uh, took it over and put it in, uh, this is when it splashed in into Racine, Wisconsin, then as we were getting ready to start this trip. Now, this is what we ended up doing. The yellow lines uh, are the points that, of interest that we stopped along the way. Um, and so this was a time, again, with my uh, two daughters and, and my dog, uh, of course, my, and my wife, uh, who you can see her driving up there in that picture. Um, so this was our experience, and, and I had, you know, I studied this trip for about a year, and I have absolutely no regrets about it. It was the, it was an amazing time together, because uh, when you're just, you're in 40 feet, that's what we had, living space was 40 feet for the whole family. So you got to, you know, get to know the fam a little bit better and, and work together. The sunsets are absolutely fantastic. You could fool anybody that you were in the Caribbean when you get on, the, on Lake Michigan and see some of the, the times that we had there together. I learned a lot on that trip, um, you know, and just speaking with people and just the, the knowledge. I mean, it's actually uh, very deep. It's over 900 feet deep. The, uh, the Lake Michigan, uh, this is as, as opposed to the Mississippi River, where the average depth is 12 feet, you know, from Minneapolis to New Orleans. Uh, so it's, it's a very, it's a deep water. Um, it comes from the American Indian word Michigami, which means great water. And so, uh, of course, it did melt my credit card. Um, you can imagine it's not the most economical mode of transportation. I, my boat gets uh, 
a half a mile to the gallon. So if you did the math at you know, four to four fifty a gallon, it's like airport food. They can jack it up because where else are you going to get the gas? You can't go anywhere else. So uh, it's it's uh, it's a little pricey, no question about it. Um, but nevertheless, I'm amazed at the amount of boats. Not only in my in my own marina in in La Crosse, Wisconsin, but those on Lake Michigan. I take I was going from marina marina, and they're like, "You're doing what?" And I'm like, "You're going to go across Lake Michigan." I'm like. Yeah, what you have this beautiful body of water and you don't take advantage of it. They're either afraid of it or they're afraid of their boat. And they get they get um, paranoid and, and stifled by the technology. They're a little overwhelmed. And so it's like, look, these are significant investments that you have made. They shouldn't just flow, sit there in your slip. You should take this out, use it, take advantage of it. And so just like with surgery, as I was sharing with some of you, I just the way you get better at boating, Ways, same way you got to better with surgery. You just hang out with people who have more experience than yourself. It's called a residency. So I would just practice, and I would spend more time around more seasoned captains than myself. And then pretty soon now, over the course of your career as a surgeon, but also as a boater, then you become the person who people are coming to for advice and learning. And, and you know, But there's always some uh, way to uh, overcome some of this. One way that we've overcome this, um, the amount of this technology is is through checklists. And this is actually, uh, that's my wife's handwriting. She's kind of uh, retentive as well, so this is actually laminated. Um, <laughs> and uh, because just when I think I understand my boat and, and got it memorized, I forget to flip a switch or do something, and, you know, I look like an idiot. And so this is an updated version because I used to button up everything and walk up to the car and realize I had left my keys and my wallet back. On the, in, on the vault, and I'd have to go undo it again. So we actually had to add that to the second 2.0 version of this uh, checklist. So, but checklists work. Um, obviously, Atul Gawande has written about this. I mean, there's actually decreasing complications and mortality has been lowered by, by using a checklist. Uh, he's gone on to write a book about this. Um, I've had the privilege of meeting him in the past, and uh, this, this was it. it. You know, it's nothing elegant. It's nothing, but it's just a checklist just to make sure that from the human error standpoint that we're not missing things. Now, uh, we rolled this out at our hospital. Um, our CEO got to uh, meet Dr. Gwande as well, and he was really fired up about this. And, and our chief of anesthesia was a com offended that it said pulse oximeter on patient and functioning. He's like, we never forget it. I said, well, then every time you put it on, just say, check, you know? There, but he was so offended, thinking that that was such an offense to him, he, that we had to take it off for it to be on our checklist. So that's pretty sad, because Atul Gwanda emails our CEO, sidebar story, and says, hey, great job that you rolled it out. I noticed you changed the checklist. You know, is there a reason for that? And the CEO forwards it to me and goes, do you want to answer that? And I'm like, you don't want me to answer that because I will be very honest, which is that, you know, ego and hubris took the place of that, you know. And so um, there's a reason that, that airline pilots have checklists. Not this flight on the way down, but I just had one right before it uh, to go speak in Chicago this weekend. And um, I was walking through the smaller plane, and you could see the pilot in the cockpit, you know, through that side window. And I, he had this thing in front of him. I'm like, oh, that's cool. He's doing his checklist. And as I got a little closer, I was like, oh, shoot. And he was playing solitaire on his iPad. And I was like, <laughs> OK, not what I was hoping to see. But because this flight, Delta Airlines flight 1141, OK, lasts 22 seconds. Why is that? Because they didn't put the flaps down. Now, again, I'm not a pilot. Some of you may be. But I know the laws of physics. You cannot generate enough lift on takeoff unless you have the flats extended. And, and they didn't. And so this flight lasted 22 seconds. And so this is something that they say they never forget, OK? But that's why it's on the checklist. Why should we since not have the pulse oximeter on there? Since that story and publication of this, my, uh, that chairman of anesthesia has told me he walked in on once and there was no pulse oximeter on a patient. So clearly there is room for improvement. Now, you think that's a fluke, just one plane crash from that. Well, no, these are uh, several plane crashes that have either that have happened because the pilots didn't have the flaps down or in the right location, and the warning horn didn't go off to remind them to do it. What's our warning horns in the operating room? That's our circulator, who should say, do the timeout. We're not starting this case until we've done it. And so they should be, have the, 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 um, they should be willing to want to speak up and say, you know, hold off, folks. Don't, you know, be in a hurry. Let's run the checklist. Let's run the timeout together here. And um, so uh, 
interestingly now with technology, being a uh, minimally invasive surgeon and I like some of the toys and stuff that they have, you can actually configure the newer, some of the newer industry colleagues that they come out with the technology in the OR, you can, if you do laparoscopic surgery, you can actually configure it that it won't turn on until you've done the timeout and it's all time stamped in there and it's proven that it's been done before the, the power on the camera will even come up, so something to think about. So they clearly work, they definitely improve, observed, and actual, you know, perceived teamwork and communication in the operating room. And there was an actual decrease in complications related to these, the use of the checklist. I mean, they actually showed decrease in surgical site infections by adherence to the checklist. Overall complications have been lowered by use of checklists and even mortality, as you can see by the confidence interval just a little bit over there on that force plot, have actually shown improvements by maintaining surgical safety checklists. So I encourage you to, um, encourage you to use them um, in, in uh, they, they, they work not only for my bolt, but in the operating room as well. Now, this is uh, me back in the boat into the slip, and I was just looking at this photo again, because this, uh, this is our little rat dog here, multi-poo. Um, I didn't realize, I have no idea whose dog that is, but it's, it's in my seat nevertheless behind me. But um, So it's easy to take a boat out of the slip. A little bit more sport, backing it into the slip with the wind, the currents, the things going on. And so you gotta be on your A game for this. Now, again, I have teenage daughters and then they're sitting in the back with all of their friends and they got the, their tunes jamming. And so it can, can be a little crazy, a little interference. And so when we're back in the boat into, a, into the slip, that's when we sell them, go down in the galley, take your friends, take your music, we turn off the music and then we just focus on the task at hand. And uh, um, there's some advantage to that, you know, by not having uh, chit chat on things other than other than the task at hand. This is very similar to, again, to the airline al al analogy of the um, sterile cockpit rule, which is up until you get up to 10,000 feet and then de descent below 10,000 feet. The pilots are not supposed to be talking to each other unless it's about flying the plane. They can't just be saying, you know, hey, where are you going this weekend? And they're not supposed to do that type of thing. And so this really helps for me. Um, uh, there are times when um, I use this in the operating room. For instance, on a uh, laparoscopic Heller myotomy. So um, I jam to the tunes. I have my, I'm a child of the 80s, so I have the 80s all the time playing in there. And, uh, and uh, we put the ports in, we dissect out the esophagus and everything, but when it gets time for the actual doing the myotomy, particularly if I'm training a resident or fellow, um, music turns off, no, it's silence in the room, and we just focus on the task at hand on making that myotomy perfect. So, um, and then when we're done with that, you know, and, and that, the, the little spicy part's over, then we go back, you know, music comes back on, you know, for closing and things like that. And so there's actually some data to support that when they've actually looked at, when they've uh, added noise and then had uh, communication take place in the operating room, uh, it deteriorates when there's noise in the operating room. And then you add trying to do a task, just doing peg transfer and answering a question with uh, unfiltered noise in the background, it actually decreases the quality of the, of the, of the tasks by, the, by surgeons. And so there, there is some data to support that. Now this is a beautiful picture of Lake Michigan, and, and is, this is where most of the major shipwrecks are on Lake Michigan. So um, it's really amazing because on my boat, it would actually like, on the radar, it would show you like on the GPS every, and it's where, when you're going over shipwrecks, and, it, and it's just like stars in the sky. And so I've talked to these cap captains when I was preparing for this trip that they fear the Great Lakes more than the ocean itself because you can do what's called the great loop the loop takes you all the way down the mississippi down to the coast then you go up the eastern seaboard and then you can either cut it in the new york waterway system or go to the st lawrence seaway and then you get back to the great lakes and then they all go through all the great lakes back to chicago back to the chicago river back to the illinois river back to the mississippi river so it's called the great loop and the people who do it are called loopers um, so it does connect but you talk to them and they said they fear the great lakes more than that open ocean run because the, the wavelengths are shorter, it bangs the boat more, and then the way the, the, the storms can come up on you very quickly. So they have tremendous respect for the lake. And uh, this was what I envisioned, <laughs> well, this time would be spent like on my sabbatical. I mean, I've earned this, right? I, this is my time to prevent burnout. And uh, so um, 
I, when the boat got taken over there, we put it on the lake. Uh, I talked to the harbor master. I said, look, I'm a river rat. I live on the Mississippi River. Um, what's the rules out here on the lake? And he's like, there's only one. He's like, you do not go out on this lake if there is bad weather. I said, the boat will handle more than you can, but do not go out on the lake. You must respect it. You stay in port, break out a deck of cards, you know, and go out the next day. So fair enough. All right. Tuck that little nugget away. And then we got up the next morning to start our journey. And, and it is a monsoon in Chicago. On the radar, it's like all orange. I'm three hours north of it in Racine, Wisconsin. And I get out, and I'm like, mm, yeah. and we waited about an hour. And then I thought this was my window. It's pouring rain, everything. And we un I fired up the engines. I untied the lines. And the harbor master, because my kids were little at the time, he comes out, and he literally he goes like this. And he goes, WTF? And I said, I said, this is my window. This is as good as it's going to get. I think this is when I can make it. And I left. And so bad judgment, all right? So this is radar. As you can, this is the radar. And you can see this is me. There's no other boats on Lake Michigan. And um, this is we're just pulling out. And we got about an hour off. I mean, we got about a mile offshore. And we're banging along. I'm thinking that's okay. And then we get about five miles offshore, and the waves are really starting to get bigger. And the wind's coming so hard, and the rain's coming, that I thought, hmm, this is interesting. I got about three hours of this because I had reservations at my favorite restaurant in Chicago. Friends were already there and ready to meet us. And so I had my judgment was clearly clouded as I made this poor choice. And then I got 16 miles offshore. And the waves are coming over the top of the boat so much that the windshield wipers can't keep up with it anymore. There's two holes. There's a river literally running through the inside of my boat, down both sides here. There are two holes in the back of the boat. I never knew what they were for. And it's for such a time as this, for this extra water to run out, you know, down the sides of the boat the whole time. Now, I'm white knuckled Think of what in the world did I do getting myself into this. The only one sicker than, the, than my wife was the dog. And he's the only one who puked on the trip. <laughs> and so, um, and I'm thinking, okay, this is what I've been preparing for the last year. This is my sabbatical. This is my rest of rejuvenation to prevent burnout. And this is what I've gotten myself into. And this is, uh, let me tell you, you can learn a lot from yourself. I call these uh, <laughs> Lieutenant Dan moments. This is between me and God. And uh, you, like I said, you learn a lot about when you put yourself in a crisis situation in terms of your character, your faith, what do you lean on that gets you through some of these times. And uh, at this point, my one of my daughters is reading her book. She's down in the galley. She comes up and she sits next to me through this harrowing situation. And she looks at me and she goes, Dad, are you scared? And now put yourself in this situation, which you just put your family into. And I've been pre preparing for this trip for a year. I knew the boat could handle more than me. I knew to get a May Day off before the batteries went underwater if we sank. I knew how to tell the latitude and longitude. I taught my wife how to do that if something happened to me. The kids are wearing their life jackets. Um, I knew to create a debris field so a lot of stuff floats so that the helicopter can see you uh, easier from the sky. And um, so I, this is all running through my mind as she looks at me and you think about it. And as I'm white knuckled at the, at the helm there, I, I looked at her and I did what any other father would do in that situation. I lied. And I said, I said, no. And she took her book and walked right back down to the galley and started reading her, her story again. So it's interesting when we as surgeons find ourselves in unexpected, unanticipated events in the operating room. Because they've actually studied this. And I roll a lot of film. Um, I, I record a lot of things because I call it the Zapruder effect. You, you'd never know when you're going to find something good. You remember Zapruder is doing the Kennedy thing. And that's a 22 frames per second. That's how they got the shots and all that stuff. Because unless you're rolling film, you never know if you're going to catch something good. And so uh, including some of my mistakes, which I like to present at, at, at regional and national meetings so that people can learn from them. But they did this where they were rolling film. And you look at. The, how we as surgeons act during unanticipated events in the operating room. And it's not good because particularly towards the trainees, uh, our quality of our leadership skills degrade when we face an unanticipated intraoperative event. When we are needed at our most, you know, we, 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 don't, we don't shine and we take it out on them. Now, I could have taken it out of my daughter. I could have done, done the displaced aggression thing and all that stuff. But no, I just said, 
I said, no, she had faith in me, and then that was the end of that. But that's clearly something that we need to, to work on. Well, the storm settled down. This was Chicago as we began to enter it. This is Burnham Harbor. This is uh, Soldier Field right here. So we pu pulled in right behind here. We were able to make it to the dinner at one of my favorite restaurants. And, and then um, over an adult beverage, I was able to contemplate my decision making <laughs> at that point that had led to this situation I'd got myself in. It reminded me of the book, Forgive and Remember, which is the mantra we really need to keep for M&M Conference. Okay, because that's really what it, it's based off of uh, the, the, the four ways that you classify the errors. And, and clearly, in this case, this was a judgment error. I mean, all the signs were there. Don't go. And, and I went anyway. And boy, it reminds me of, of, of M&M Conference um, when we look back, you know, and you're three days out from your colon resection, your patient's tympanetic, they're tachycardic, they're not, they're not, you have to bolus them, they're not making urine parameters. You know, maybe a little bead of sweat on the corner here. They just aren't looking right. And uh, white counts 14. And then you you lab them up, and the and the and the urinalysis is a little dirty. And you go, yep, it's a urinary tract infection. It's like ah, I'm, no, I'm pretty sure it's a leak. But uh, we talk ourselves into these things sometimes, and and that's exactly what I had done. And so the whole point is, we don't want to get there. This is a shipwreck. This is a a big tanker that went down in Lake Michigan. This is um, the Manitou Islands, and these are the Straits of Manitou. And I met a seasoned captain, I had to go through here, and he's like, oh, I've only seen it calm water one time in my entire career, and I was like, great. And so, <laughs> and he goes, oh, and there's this great shipwreck you need to go check out. And he gave me the coordinates, and so we found this tanker. And if you notice, I sent him an email, I called it Manitou Glass. So uh, we got lucky because it was very calm that day. And uh, this is a tanker that had gone down in, in a storm in the 60s. Now, surely there were some technical factors. They lost their uh, radar. So he was flying blind, the captain was, and then he lost engines, and then he was just a little bobber out there. And, uh, and they wrecked, and he, it's still there. That's half of the ship. The other half goes all the way under. There's literally a 1,000 birds that's all uh, perched on there when we got all the way up to it. And uh, I think about these shipwrecks and uh, what judgment factors, though, led to me that he could have maybe have done to keep himself from, you know, shipwrecking this and ending up on the shoals because that's exactly what we are supposed to be doing as, as surgeons is, you know, we, we, we want to prevent our patients from having these types of adverse outcomes. Now, this is my wife. I don't show this to, to illustrate her muscles. Um, I, illus I wanted to show you the, the infinity line. I mean, there were literally times where it was so beautiful, you cannot tell the water from the sky. It's, that is absolutely gorgeous out there. But the other thing I wanted to highlight here was, um, was uh, the, the teamwork. Uh, we all have our different jobs. My wife is, uh, I, she does drive the boat because for those who do that loop, one of the biggest reasons isn't that the spouse or significant other doesn't know how to write, drive the boat. It's just that often if there's it's usually the, the husband has a heart attack or stroke. Uh, it's that they don't know how to use the radio. They don't know how to tell the coordinates of where they are for help. So I had already trained her about that in case I had an MI in the middle of this thing. But, but she, I have taught her to drive the boat. She is one of the few female captains that does, you know, I've taught her. She does back the boat into the slip at times, usually with minimal morbidity. Um, but uh, she, she loves that when, when she does. I make her do it. And uh, she loves it because she calls me Fender Boy. Then when I'm out switching sides with her and then and, and I'm managing this. One time we came into a, a, a marina and this guy was with, with the salmon, of course. They got the salmon there and uh, very, uh, a charter fisherman. And as I walked past him, he looks at me and he goes, I like the way you handle your boat. I said, excuse me? He goes, I was coming in behind you, coming in off of the lake. And he says, I like the way you handle your boat. He goes, every member of your team had a job, and you had, you, know, you had designated, and I could see them each doing their job, your kids and your wife, as you all came in. And he goes, I like the way you handle your boat. I said, well, that was very kind of you. And uh, he proceeded to uh, fillet this and give us to it, and then teach us how to uh, eat it for dinner uh, that evening. And um, so there's a lot of um, 
a lot of data on this in terms of our work to working together in the operating room. And when you think about how you handle your boat or a ha how you handle your operating room, I'm pretty amazed. Think about all the inputs that we have, you know, between the circulator, the anesthesiologist, the trainees, the residents, the fellows. Um, ultimately, all of this has to culminate and what we want is a, is a uh, excellent outcome for our patient. Um, and when you think of all of those inputs, a lot of work that needs to go into that um, when you look at us as surgeons, as leaders, um, Claude Deschamps, has, he's, he's written on this. And uh, when you look at these four domains, I mean, I think I do okay on uh, problem solving and decision. I think I'm, I'm, I'm pretty good. I'm at, at leadership management, always looking to get better. I think my personal strength is situational awareness. I think that's probably my biggest strength. I mean, I know every single thing that seems to be going on in the room. Um, at all times, and my partners sometimes come, uh, have pulled me aside and said, you know, how can you have such low complication rates and not scrub so many of your cases? You leave the residents and fellows in there all the time. And it's because I think it's my situational awareness. Just because I'm not scrubbed doesn't mean I don't have any idea of what's going on. Um, and I know when to scrub and when to give them, uh, to back off and let them, um, you know, have the confidence and the skills uh, to proceed. The one I need work on, though, um, clearly is um, conflict resolution. I'm not very good at it. Some of you guys are good at it. Um, I'm not. Um, I mean, I'm a surgeon, so I'm pretty good at making, creating conflict. Um, I mean, I, like I said, by definition, is I'm, a, I, I'm a surgeon, so I, I leave a wake everywhere I go, just like my boat. Um, and so clearly, that's an area where I, I need, to, need to improve upon. Um, now, for those of you who, uh, particularly, you probably suffer the same thing I do in my program, which is you walk in one day and you've got the ENT scrub tech, and you're like, huh. And then the next day you got the ortho tech, and you're like, well, that's odd. Where's the general surgery one? Well, she's next door, or he's next door. I was like, that's odd, because why can't we get the same team uh, doing what they do? <clears throat> and there's actually data to support that. It's called the teaming curve. And they looked at when just the exact same teams worked together operative times diminished. And so this is the same thing on my boat. When my family is working together as a team, it's very efficient. It's very easy to, to, to dock the boat in. And then, you know, we do a lot of uh, the um, cocktail cruises. We bring friends out. We do all the stuff. And, you know, they all want to help. You know, it's like, what do I do? What do I do? And I'm like, nothing. Just sit there with your drink. And that's what I, that's the best thing you could possibly do rather than, you know, try and, try and be helpful at this time. Because, you know, when you've got the team that knows what you're doing, there's actually data to support this, you know, from an administrative standpoint. You know, on $80 a minute, which it is, I think, in our, in our hospital, uh, there is something to, for decreasing operative time just by having that team, team effect. Now, this was an interesting study. They looked at trauma teams in simulated scenarios, but they actually taught them, uh, they videotaped them, uh, before and after, and then a couple weeks later, but they taught them communication behaviors, leadership behaviors. And the fascinating thing, and then they videotaped them and they put them through these scenarios, how you would react in these scenarios. And, and the fascinating thing is that many of these leadership, communication and cooperation, decision-making, uh, they improved. Not only did they improve immediately after the scenario, but several of them stayed out until three weeks later. They were able to keep that behaviors ingrained, which is exactly the direction that we need to be going, you know, as surgeons. Of course, we perceive our attitudes. Uh, there's always a, there's this mismatch. Interesting study out of uh, Scotland where they looked at surgeons and trainees, and they said, well, surgeons, how would you describe your leadership style And they in the operating room? They said it was collaborative. And then they talked to the anesthesiologists and the nurses, and they thought it was autocratic. So there was just clearly a disconnect. Um, similarly, they looked at another study. Looked at uh, how how poorly did you explain that that what you were getting ready to do for the day in that case? Five percent of the time, they, the surgeons thought they did a bad job. The rest of the team thought it was fifty percent of the time. A coin toss that they had no idea really what the plan was, what the game plan, what the course of action was going to be during this operation. Um, so again, not only does improving our leadership as captain of the ship in the operating room, not only is that just ultimately good, uh, good leadership skills to have, it actually provides a sense of, of psychological safety. And then that pays for better environment for learning. When my daughter came up and asked me, 
Daddy, are you scared? Now, sure I was inside, to, to, uh, but, but that doesn't mean that I exuded that in my, in, the, in my interactions. And when I told her no, what that did was it, she said, well, if Daddy's not scared, there's no reason I need to be. And so she promptly took her book and went down and started reading again. So when, when things hit the fan in the operating room, uh, those of us as a captainship, there are times where we need to at least maintain a sense of leadership and calm because if we lose it, I'm pretty sure I guarantee the rest of your team's gonna lose it at that point. Now, one of the most common questions I get um, on that, from this trip is, well, did you always stay inside a land? Now, I know that that would provide some kind of psychological comfort by being able to see land somewhere, but the, the answer is no, you can't cross Lake Michigan and, and actually stay see land the whole way. But let me tell you, after a long day on the lake, it was very reassuring to see a lighthouse that would help to guide me to port. Um, I learned a lot about these lighthouses. These are all, um, these are all Stuart-esque photos taken by my daughter. And um, there's a variety of, of lighthouses, and uh, uh, they all serve uh, some purposes, but, you know, and they're all designed a slightly different style. The one I thought was really unique uh, had two lights, and so uh, to guide you into the channel, because if you got out of the channel, they were set in such a way you'd only see one light, and if you went too far into the other channel, you'd only see one light. So to know you were truly in the, in the right channel, you would see both lights above each other. That was kind of a cool lighthouse. So what do these lighthouses do? I mean, what's the purpose of a lighthouse? A, a lighthouse is it's a tower, it's a beacon. I mean, it's there, it's illuminating, and of course, it serves as a reference point. And so, I often thought about these lighthouses. This is very similar to our surgical mentors. What are our surgical mentors? They're towers, they're beacons. They are illuminating to us, and they serve as a reference. Think about it, whether it's a as a junior faculty, as a career choice, um, an interoperative decision-making thing, or a, a decision one has to make uh, with regards to a career advancement and everything. What do we do? We go to our mentors, right? To get advice on whatever it may be. Maybe it's on a patient in clinic. Maybe it's right there interoperatively. Maybe it's on um, life's goals and, and, you know, and um, academic pursuits. Um, but I can tell you, you're in good company here. Because uh, you know who's one, you know one of the finest mentors I know is you're sitting right here. You've got Dr. Ronnie Stewart, and I I mean, again, thanks to Rich following him on uh, Twitter, and I see what people say about Dr. Stewart in terms of the uh, what an amazing mentor and leader that he is, and 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 um, that's my goal someday is to be able to achieve to to achieve that. Uh, as well, so I'm I'm am not there yet. I'm, but I hope to I hope to head in that direction. Now, what keeps us from being mentors over here, far side? Time, simply not enough time in the day to be a mentor. And uh, less than fifty percent of medical students ended up having a mentor. Less than twenty percent of faculty had a mentor in this study. And these are very important decisions to ha well, that mentors have for us. I mean, I, I can remember, I mean, it's not like I just loved surgery when I was in medical school, but I loved the people. They, they are the ones that drew me to the field and, 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 and pushed me away from other fields because I was like, it's not so much I just despised internal medicine, but it was uh, some of the, the personalities and the people of that just said, this isn't for me. But it really probably wasn't that it wasn't internal medicine. It was some of the, it was the personalities and the people. And I was drawn to the people in surgery because of that mentorship. And it has, we know that it has tremendous impact on our own personal careers. And not only that, even subspecialty careers, think about it. Do we go into the field that, we go into the field that our mentors were in? That's, I mean, how much did we love the field versus how much we just loved our mentor who loved that field? Um, hard, to, hard to tease that out, but clearly mentorship plays an important part. Um, doc, the late Dr. Tom Russell had a tremendous impact on my career as well. And, you've, and I thought he stated it best when he says in his presentation, mentors are interested in their trainees not only professionally but as human beings as well. They promote their trainees' efforts to balance professional and personal needs and obligations. They are on multiple levels a resident or a student support system and biggest fan. Dr. Tom Russell had a tremendous impact on my life. You know, he was the executive director of the college, and 
early in my career, I, at our State Surgical Society meeting, which I went on to eventually be, have the privilege of being the president of, I gave a talk on, you know, building a Beartree program from scratch. Like two years later, I'm walking down the streets of San Francisco at the college meeting, and here come these footsteps up behind me. And he looks at me and he goes, hey, you're Qatari, right? I was like, yeah. Wisconsin, right? I said, yeah. I'm like, oh my gosh, this is a Tom Russell. I mean, this is a, and he goes, two years ago, you gave a talk on how to build a Beartree program. He goes, it's still the best talk I've ever heard on the topic. And I'm just like, are you kidding me? This is a man who visited all 50 state chapters. He sat through hundreds, if not thousands, of, of paper presentations by, by faculty and residents. And he takes the time out of his busy schedule to say that to me. You have any idea what that does to a guy, a junior person like myself? You know, that was amazing for me. So that, you know, then when he passed, when I gave my uh, donation to the college for the um, 100 year anniversary of the college, um, I dedicated mine um, uh, to Dr. Tom Russell. This is an interesting lighthouse. This one's smack dab in the middle of Lake Michigan.